Good afternoon. Uh, I first, I know Claire introduced uh, Rich and Ming, but I just like them to stand up and wave uh, to everyone here. Uh, both of them were Yale undergrads. Uh, they also graduated from Yale Law School, uh, and they, they now work in our uh, organization. And uh, the reason I want to introduce them right now is uh, I make it stuck uh, as uh, in part of the presentation where I need that, their expertise and they can uh, step in, try to explain uh, all of this blockchain and crypto stuff. This is the third session of a three-part series. Uh, in the first two parts, I talked about uh, digitization uh, and digital media and how that relates to sports. Uh, as you know, if you recall, I talked about more and more people are watching sports, uh, not on TV, but on a digital platform like ESPN+. The second session was about how uh, fans now engage with sports um, uh, using uh, gamified environments, uh, whether it's video games or even betting on sports. And as an owner of a sports team, uh, that presents a opportunity for us to explore a lot of more econ new economic uh, opportunities in gamification. And uh, so today's session is about uh, blockchain, crypto, and sports, and how they all sort of fit together. And uh, again, uh, from a sports owner and a, a sports business standpoint, uh, we see this as uh, having huge economic potential for sports teams and also leagues. I'll give a brief overview of how uh, the whole crypto world fits together with sports. Uh, what we've seen, literally just in the last, uh, I would say, six months, is um, a lot of the uh, applications of blockchain have gravitated toward uh, sports because there is content, there is intellectual property uh, that they can license from. What I'm gonna talk about is sort of three broad areas. Number one is um, NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens, and I will get into a little bit of that. The second thing is uh, fan tokens. If you think about fans, how uh, sports teams want to engage with their fans, there are tokens that could reside on the blockchain uh, where fans can feel like they actually own something and they have something invested in the team. And the third area is just sponsorships. I'll you know, talk about that because there's a lot, that's where most of the money is today in terms of uh, channeling a lot of the blockchain, uh, I guess, awareness where the, the people that are developing blockchain applications uh, wanna capture an audience in sports and that's where they put, put in the sponsorship dollars. I feel like I probably don't need to go through a crypto 101 type of uh, uh, explanation, um, but I just want to kind of level set because I realize not, maybe not everybody has been steep in, in, in all of this. Uh, so for us, when we look at uh, blockchains, what's, why is blockchain important? And why is, why is it important to understand cryptocurrencies? Um, and, and why, did, why do people think that they, uh, crypto assets have intrinsic value? Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that they are decentralized networks so that if, if you think about assets that you own digitally, it's not stored in just one place or, uh, or in a USB or something. It's, it's, it's basically distributed across uh, a, a huge computer network. Uh, so it's kind of like nowhere, but it's everywhere. And the other thing, important thing about ownership of digital assets is that it's secure, it's immutable, it's permanent uh, because it resides on the blockchain. And I'll uh, get into that a little bit. Um, decentralized networks, um, is, is really the fundamental underpinning of uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. You know, here we use uh, the example of a Bitcoin uh, blockchain because 
Uh, that's kind of the purest form of a uh, uh, blockchain. It's very, uh, people say Bitcoin, the Bitcoin protocol is very inefficient. Uh, and that's because it's very, very decentralized. There's literally hundreds of thousands of computers spread around the globe. Um, and when you process a transaction uh, in uh, relating to Bitcoin, uh, every computer node is involved and it takes a long, quite a long time to verify, to authenticate a transaction on the chain. And uh, that, that to us is like sort of the purest form of blockchain. Um, the, the whole sort of blockchain network has uh, an ecosystem of different actors. Uh, there are people that validate transactions uh, there are software engineers that kind of maintain the files, uh, maintain the software. Uh, and then uh, there are miners uh, that actually do work. They mine to earn, you know, Bitcoin. It's because the whole idea of verifying a transaction on the chain uh, is that you have to prove to people you've done the work. So... The best analogy, I mean, it's, it took me quite a while to really understand all of this, uh, but the best analogy for me is if you want to prove to your teacher or to your professor that you've done, you've done the research work and you have to like, you know, look, you know, read through a few books and you have to verify that uh, uh, what is said in the book is true by looking, looking up something on the internet, whatever it is, that work in itself may or may not take you uh, a long time. But your professor says, in order to prove that you've actually done the work, uh, the book that you need to access is sitting on top of a building that's 100 flights of stairs. So you actually have to, so in order to prove that you actually read the book, you have to climb 100 flights of stairs to get to the book and then do the verification. That's, that's what mining is about. It's, Ming, am I, is that a good analogy? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so uh, in the whole Bitcoin uh, world, uh, people are starting to uh, complain that this is very energy intensive because it takes actually a lot of computing power uh, to verify that people have done the work. I will talk about this later. So the entire sort of blockchain world is moving away from requiring people to climb 100 flights of stairs, what they call proof of work type of uh, mechanism, and evolving that to other consensus mechanisms uh, to prove that you've done the work. Uh, uh, things like proof of stake, proof of history, and those other uh, consensus mechanisms. I think the important thing about uh, the history of each transaction is stored in a way that's permanent and that's not mutable. Uh, the other idea is that it, the ownership is very secure, all right? And we will get into the uh, concept of digital ownership of uh, art and things like that. When, in, when we talk about NFT, uh, the security of ownership is very, very important. And the, the whole idea here is that blockchain ensures that security is there uh, so that nobody could really uh, steal it, nobody could change it. You'll hear a lot of uh, people that invest in cryptocurrencies, uh, they'll say this is the best form of uh, storing your asset value because governments cannot confiscate it away from you. And uh, think about that. You know, if you own anything else, if you own stocks in the company or cash sitting in a bank or uh, gold is sitting in a vault, at some point, uh, maybe the government will come and take it away. So here's a quick overview of uh, the different blockchain protocols. Um, and here I have to, you know, profess uh, that I'm not, I'm not the expert, but, you know, maybe Rich can supplement. Uh, but uh, we've talked about Bitcoin as one of the protocol. There's another main major protocol uh, called Ethereum. Uh, right now, Ethereum is still uh, working on a proof of work type of uh, consensus mechanism, which is energy intensive. But there is a whole movement. Uh, lots of uh, engineers are working on moving that to a uh, proof of stake 
uh, type of consensus mechanism, which is less energy intensive and more environmentally friendly. Uh, we also have uh, other, I would say, leading blockchain protocols, Flow and Solana. And by the way, you can also you can buy cr- currencies associated with these uh, blockchain protocols. Uh, you can buy buy Flow tokens. You can, can buy uh, Solana tokens. The next thing is I wanted to talk about just the fundamentals of non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and then get into how that relates to uh, sports. Uh, NFT fundamentally uh, is a digital asset that is uh, not fungible with another digital asset, right? And you can think of uh, in the in the uh, traditional world. Um, Non-fungible things are art. You know, uh, Picasso doesn't do the same painting twice. Uh, so every piece of art created by an art- artist is unique and not fungible with the other piece of art. Also, diamonds. Diamonds come in different shapes, sizes, quality. Uh, so things like that. On the other side of the ledger, you know, you have fungible things. Uh, in the in the real world, we have Currencies, U.S. dollar, Japanese yen, the Chinese renminbi, they're fungible currencies. Uh, Commodities are also fungible. Oil, uh, gold, you know, they're they're fungible. And uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, if you buy Bitcoin, one Bitcoin traded on one exchange is the same as another Bitcoin traded on another exchange. Doesn't matter who you buy from. So that's the concept of fungibility, and non-fungibility is uh, obviously there. Each asset is unique. So in the so the same concept in the real uh, physical world, when you port that into the digital world, you will also have non-fungible uh, digital assets. This is uh, now a pretty uh, commonly uh, accepted concept in the art world. Um, I just talked to a student who's doing uh, her thesis on NFTs. Uh, You're a art history major, right? Uh, So, you know, think about owning physical art. Um, I have to worry about, uh, you know, where do I put it? Uh, If I keep it in my house, will someone break into my house and steal it? Um, If I keep it in storage, I have to pay pay money to the storage operator, so I have a cost of carry, carrying the art. But when everything is digitized, it's actually pretty frictionless. Um, I can transfer it more easily to somebody else. I could store it. Uh, I don't worry that it'll get lost because it it sits on the blockchain. And uh, that's what NFT is about. And that's why NFT, the concept of an NFT has become very uh, prominent in the art world. Okay, yeah, this, this just says, you know, I don't have to worry about storage costs or damage uh, or insurance. Uh, very low transaction fees. Today in the physical art world, if I want to buy and sell art, I either take my art to a dealer and the dealer will basically buy at wholesale prices from me and then they'll sell retail to somebody else so the dealer captures a margin. Or I put it up for auction at one of the auction houses like Sotheby's or Christie's, uh, they charge a huge fee as well. Um, but in the, in the digital world, if I want to transfer uh, NFTs, and because these NFTs are developed on uh, common blockchain protocols like you know Ethereum or, or or Flow, the transfer fees are associated with whatever it costs uh, to uh, to transfer digital assets on those protocols. So they're very low fees. Um, the other thing to understand about blockchain uh, assets that are held in on the blockchain is that they're they're held in wallets, and these wallets are, uh, what's the word for it, pseudonymous? Yeah, pseudonymous, in other words, you kind of know the name of the wallet, except that you have no idea who's behind the wallet. Each wallet has an address. It's like a string of letters that's 
very, very long. But those wallet addresses are actually public. It's public information. So it's very, very transparent. When you transfer something, whether it's Bitcoin or NFT from one wallet to another wallet, uh, that transaction history is permanently residing on the blockchain. And uh, the transparency of this whole thing actually uh, you know, reduces the risk of uh, fraud um, and the risk of loss. Because if someone tries to do nefarious things through these wallets, uh, those wallets will very quickly get blacklisted by the whole blockchain community and people will stop transacting with them. And that's a very, very interesting thing because you would think about the crypto world as bad people hiding behind uh, anonymously, uh, except that these wallets are public, so they do bad things, there's gonna be consequences, and people can very quickly stop transacting with you. And uh, that minimizes the risk of fraud. So, NFT uh, collectible use cases are really, really strange. I mean, to me, I'm, I'm kind of too old for this because there are all these uh, really interesting sort of pieces of, I don't even consider it art. It's, it's like, you know, these, uh, there, there's crypto punks and uh, there's a, uh, a, one of the most uh, popular, I guess, assets uh, has the name of Bored Ape Yacht Club. Um, Rich, do you want do you want to just talk a little bit about that and why that's so important? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little bit also hard for me to explain, I guess. But part of it is, you know, I think across some of the most popular NFTs, there's a couple of categories. One is, you know, B A Y C and CryptoPunks. There's been a whole culture in crypto where people have really gravitated towards these pixelated or digital images that are basically profile pictures. A lot of them put them up on Twitter. A lot of them also showcase them on other platforms. And uh, for whatever reason, the crypto community has assigned a massive amount of value to these assets. I think in part because they're Genesis assets. They're like the first wave of really interesting NFTs that you can function and use as profile pictures. The other thing that's there um, is a different class of NFTs that have gotten really popular. And they're actually NFTs used in gaming. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you guys have heard of a game called Axie Infinity. But it's a game, it's kind of like Pokemon back in the day, where you can basically buy um, a creature, they call them axes, and they, they're NFTs. But then what you can use them for is you can uh, play games with these NFTs. And actually, like the way the game works is if you um, use these axes and you can battle against other people with their axes, you can actually gain additional cryptocurrencies. And in certain parts of the world, it's actually become a really um, income generated game and, and way of life, basically. And Axie Infinity in particular is very popular in the Philippines. And I think the one thing we don't have a picture of on the right-hand side that, that Joe will talk to you about in a little bit is, so you've got profile picture NFTs, you've got uh, NFTs used in gaming, and the last kind of category of NFTs are like sports collectibles, basically. People have taken imagery, video clips, um, and they basically have become a form of uh, digital trading cards, basically. And uh, across all these different categories, you've seen enormous volume. I mean, billions of dollars traded on an annualized run rate context. And, you know, I think there's probably big open questions about the longevity of, of these asset prices and, and how popular these different categories of NFTs are. But I think that the, the, the thing that's been clear to date is that for whatever reason, very, very different parts of the crypto community um, have found each one of these really, really fascinating and spent a lot of money collecting and trading and investing in these assets, basically. Mm. And here we have one of the top uh, NFT applications is NBA Top Shot. Um, how many people know about or have bought uh, stuff on NBA Top Shot? Oh, actually a lot. Okay. I'm, I'm very encouraged. That's good. Uh, so, so these are basically digitized versions of uh, sports trading cards. And uh, uh, so this uh, company called Dapper Labs have created this marketplace uh, where they would drop these, uh, uh, what they call moments, which are video clips of uh, you know, LeBron James dunking and NBA action. And people would rush to buy these packs of uh, uh, NFTs. Uh, not only that, they, you know, not only are they collecting these, but they also trade it. 
And I guess uh, the numbers here, uh, Rich, is that 778? Is that a run rate number? It, uh, that's a that's a year to day actuals number. Actually. Yeah, yeah, year to day actual. So year to day actual, it's uh, over 700 million dollars of these digital moments on MDA Top Shots have been traded, and you know that's that's really extraordinary if you think about uh, you know how I mean how much value is flowing to these marketplaces, all right? Um, uh, why is it called NBA Top Shot? It's because all the content, all the uh, you know, uh, inf uh, content that support the videos are NBA clips, NBA action. And why is it important to someone like me? It's because they pay the NBA uh, to license the uh, content. And it's ha it has been a very uh, lucrative deal for, for the NBA. So this is just a, a, a bit more uh, granularity on, on how this thing, uh, how Top Shot, uh, Top Shot works. Um, Rich, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's for like those of you guys that have ever bought like trading cars, it's very, very similar, but except it's entirely digitized. You go on a website, um, there's uh, two ways to get Top Shots. The first way is the way that Joe mentioned, which is you buy a pack. It's just like you buy a pack of trading cards. You buy a pack of any kind of cards, really. And in that pack, you get a certain number of moments, typically three moments. And each of these moments basically feature a specific player and typically a couple seconds of uh, them making a basket, stealing a ball, getting a rebound, making a big play, basically. Um, so route number one is you buy a pack, and they can range from tens of dollars to hundreds of dollars uh, to even close to $1,000, depending on the rarity of the pack. And then route two is you can buy them on a secondary marketplace. And like Joe mentioned before, there's been almost $800 million of, of sort of merchandise value, you know, value of collectibles traded on the secondary marketplaces. Yeah. And uh, another application with uh, NFT in, in sports is uh, the, the idea that you can buy players, right? You know, anybody that's played uh, fantasy sports uh, will know that you, know, you put together a team. Uh, you could put together a team either for the season or just for the day's um, action. Uh, and then at the end of the day, they, you know, they'll tally up all the stats and determine who wins and who loses. And in this case, uh, you buy an NFT that represents a player. Uh, and then that comes with all the player's stats. Uh, and this is uh, uh, very popular in uh, Europe. Uh, in European soccer, there's a company that does this. Uh, so uh, the participants uh, pay for the NFT. They put together their team, their soccer team. They'll compete against each other based on the stats. I think today this product only is a, a snapshot of, uh, it's like a trading card. The stats don't get updated physically. Uh, but in the future, you can see with digital trading cards, you know, if you own the card of a particular player, their stats get constantly updated. Uh, they can become better players or worse players over time. In the case of, uh, going back to, uh, this is Top Shot, right? In the case of Top Shot, on the left-hand side, they've actually gone out to a, a number of uh, sports leagues and have already signed up NFT deals with the NBA, the NFL, UFC, uh, that's the fighting uh, mixed martial arts fighting league. So uh, Dapper Labs is the parent company of Top Shots, okay? On the right-hand side, uh, this company is so rare that does the NFT with fantasy games. Uh, they've signed up all the football, you know, the major uh, football leagues or soccer leagues in, in Europe. It's, uh, you know, English Premier League, Serie A in Italy, La Liga, Spain, Bundesliga is the German league. Uh, and then Champions League is like the, the elite kind of uh, pan-European uh, contest that they uh, they have put together. So all of these guys are all of these leagues are benefiting from this whole ecosystem in NFTs. Uh, this is just a presentation of sort of uh, the level of transactions. Left hand side is NBA and right hand side is so rare. So that's European soccer. I think there's some seasonality into it, into this. You see this uh, NBA Top Shot transact number of transactions dipped. Uh, in the summer, obviously not during the season, but as the season comes in, the transaction numbers actually pick up. Um, but you know, you could see sort of on a secular basis, 
these numbers are increasing. There are more and more participants uh, and more and more sort of believers in NFTs that are trading these things. Um, now, another application is this concept of fan tokens. Think of fan tokens as uh, if you fly airlines, right? You get uh, mileage, you participate in the mileage program. So th those are loyalty points. Uh, so if you follow the Brooklyn Nets or Golden State Warriors, uh, you can get loyalty points. So teams are thinking about uh, whether we should issue uh, tokens to our fans. And maybe these tokens can be traded, maybe not. Uh, but at least for, uh, for if you want to incentivize a specific loyalty kind of activity, uh, if they buy a ticket, uh, if they come follow on your social media, then you can reward them with loyalty points. And uh, these fan tokens can, you know, you can use the, the uh, digitized version uh, that sits on a blockchain so that fans can feel like they get something that's permanent, immutable, uh, and maybe they can trade it for value, right? So this is the, the whole concept of a fan token is taking shape. The major sports leagues in the United States have not approved uh, the issuance of fan tokens by their teams because uh, this is a league-wide thing. This is not going to, you know, we're not going to, the, the, the league is not going to let each individual team determine what they want to do. Uh, but in the case of uh, Europe, all the major soccer teams have actually uh, issued fan tokens uh, to their fans. And these tokens contain, uh, you know, certain things that could be, you know, privileges that you can use when you come into the stadium to see a game. Uh, and they could also have uh, some soft governance rights, if you will. It's not like you can, you can become the GM and trade players with these fan tokens. But, you know, for example, if you're... Uh, hold a certain number of fan tokens, then you can vote for uh, what color jersey the team will wear in during home games. If you think about NBA, right, every year they have all-star voting. You can determine all-star votes based on the number of fan tokens that people hold. So I think there's a lot of potential applications in, in, uh, in the fan token space. And the beauty of this is that the fan tokens are being traded. It's just fascinating. This is all happening in Europe, European soccer. On the left-hand side, you have top 10 fan tokens by market cap, the market value of total fan tokens. So PSG is a soccer club in France, and uh, it's $62 million uh, of market cap. That's what these third-party marketplaces have placed a value on these uh, fan tokens. And uh, people trade them like stocks uh, or like currency. As you can see, they're actually very actively traded, right? So, you, uh, so, so the interesting thing about this is that you kind of see s the similarities between uh, these NFTs and financial markets. Uh, and you will see sort of financial market characteristics being developed uh, in, the, in the whole crypto space. For example, what we've seen is uh, the development of derivatives you're not only trading Bitcoin, but you're also trading option and futures and swaps and all the derivative instruments that are based on cryptocurrencies. And that market is multiple times uh, bigger than the cash market, which is the same thing as, as uh, the financial market. The derivatives market is um, probably like, you know, X 10, 20, 30 times bigger than the actual cash stock market. And finally, uh, this is not really an application. This is just an explanation of where the economics is coming from and how that's accruing to the teams. I own the Brooklyn Nets, sports teams, the uh, NBA as the league. Uh, we all are the beneficiaries of sponsorship dollars from all of these crypto players. And why are they interested in paying us to you know, a lot of sponsorship dollars for, the, for us to market them. It's because we have a, uh, the relevant fan base, we have the right demographic. It's a, a young demographic. They want to pay us dollars in order to market to our fan base, right? And uh, so a lot of these um, uh, various 
parties participating in the crypto ecosystem are all in the customer acquisition mode, all right? And uh, there are crypto exchanges. Some of the uh, protocols themselves are also interested in sort of break out and have more of uh, name recognition for themselves. So they also pay a sports team sponsorship dollars. Here we talk about the um, arm, arms race uh, between two companies. FTX is a crypto exchange. Uh, they actually trade, most of their trades are derivatives of cryptocurrencies. And uh, crypto.com is another, is that, that's another centralized exchange, is that right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, you probably read in the news, uh, next time when you go to LA to watch a Lakers game, you're no longer going to Staples Center, you're going to crypto.com center. Okay, they just renamed Staples Center crypto.com arena. It's, it's incredible to me. And uh, the reported value of the uh, crypto.com deal with uh, uh, the Staples Center uh, is a 20-year deal that's valued at $700 million. It's, when are they gonna rename Yale Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, it's hard to fathom. Yeah, as I explained, you know, the, the, the reason why uh, all these crypto companies are spl splashing out dollars is they uh, want legitimacy by association. Um, and it's also, for them, customer acquisition. I think a lot of these exchanges, centralized exchanges, uh, all want to have uh, uh, more participants sign up with them, so set up accounts with them so that they can trade uh, uh, crypto in, in their own exchanges. Yeah, actually, that's, that's the end of the presentation. I think the interesting thing, the, the fascinating thing for me is uh, we're seeing this real time. Like this crypto.com deal with Staples Center just happened literally like two days ago. So a lot of very exciting, a lot of frothy things, right? There's, there's, there's somewhat of a bubble, but we're fundamentally believers in the whole technology of blockchain and some of the benefits that they can bring uh, to the world of art, to the world of uh, financial uh, innovation, and to the world of sports. So we're keeping very close touch with what's going on uh, and very excited by it. So thanks very much. I'll take questions. Hi, Joe. Thank you for your time. Um, so you're a big steward of lacrosse in the US. Um, and so how can like growing sports like lacrosse use crypto to grow, um, you know, become more popular? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I'm, I, I wouldn't call myself a steward of lacrosse. I'm a participant and I support lacrosse. And, uh, you know, and also we have a, our coaches sitting here from Yale Lacrosse. Um, so uh, I'm always f humble to, uh, to say that I'm, I'm somewhat associated with Yale Lacrosse because it's such an incredible program. There are just so many different ways of uh, using uh, crypto and NFTs to promote anything uh, that has a fan base, right? Uh, you know, if you think about the fans out there, you, you have existing fans that you need to kind of continue to engage to keep them loyal. Uh, you also have new fans that you can acquire. And in fact, the cryptocurrencies themselves or an NFT or a fan token that it, you can issue to fans uh, is probably one of the best customer acquisition tools out there. And today, when you, when you uh, talk about crypto, people are excited by it. People want to learn more about it. So by its own nature, uh, you attract a lot of interest. And then you attach immutable value to it. So it's like owning, it's a real asset that has, uh, you know, most people, believers, think that they have intrinsic value, right? So people are interested in owning something that is of value, um, just like trading cards. Uh, and then you can also trade it. If you can trade NFTs and cryptocurrencies, that further excites people. I mean, how many people 
you know, today are involved in the stock market, trading like crazy or buying and selling meme stocks, right? That, that creates another sort of uh, uh, foamy reaction uh, to things. So it, it, for us in, in the sports business, we are always trying to create more hype, create more excitement, because if you think about it, the engagement of a fan with sports is very emotional. It's kind of hard to pin down a hard value on it. So if there are tools like NFTs uh, that can help us engage better with fans, uh, we, we're, we're, we're all in. I am sure, you know, I'm an investor in the PLL um, and also in the NLL. Uh, I am sure at some point, probably not in the very uh, distant future, uh, that uh, PLL would figure out a way uh, to use uh, crypto to engage with their fans. Um, thank you for being here. I, um, I currently work for the Illich family, and we own the Detroit Tigers and the Red Wings. Um, and my question is, there's an aging fan base there. Do you believe NFTs are a, or fan tokens are a good way to engage younger audiences and bring them into these, um, these sports? Yeah, absolutely. You know, D Detroit Tigers, I actually think that some of the sports that are considered too old, right, you know, like baseball, uh, actually have a new lease on life when it comes to gamification of sports. Uh, so the last episode, I talked about sports betting, and I think baseball is one of those sports that it really, that's really conducive to uh, betting because every pitch, every frame is a bettable scenario. I think baseball and uh, American football are like that. The funny thing is, if you watch uh, a a football game or a baseball game, the actual action um, versus the length of the game, the actual action is less than 10% of the game. But what do people do in the rest of the time? With sports betting, they can actually, you know, get more engaged with the activity. Uh, you know, it's very, baseball and football are quite similar in that it's very scenario-based. Uh, it's, there's drama, like, in between downs and in between pitches, right? So, so that's, that's what I'm, I feel very excited about. Uh, and, and with crypto, obviously, it'll help uh, your teams to acquire a new user base uh, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. How can you differentiate true fan investment and speculative capital? I feel like some would argue that the, we have more speculative capital flowing around than we ever have before. Where do you see the future of crypto and NFTs heading? Perhaps if this level of capital declines, do you see possible conflict between speculative capital and fan loyalty? Uh, well, first, I, I think there's definitely speculative capital uh, in the whole crypto market. Uh, you know, what is speculation? Speculation is uh, buying something in the hope that it'll, it'll, you know, you'll make a lot of money, right? Uh, so there's a, there's a continuum between sort of investing and speculation. Uh, and I guess speculation can be defined as very short-term oriented. You know, if it, there's a the slight uptick, I'll sell right away to take profit. That's, that's like speculation. Uh, so, but still, that's actually investing activity. There's a lot of that activity in the crypto market today. I don't th see a conflict between fan engagement and speculation because the essence of fan engagement is hype. If you think about it, you know, if you participate, why do you watch sports? It's because it's an emotional experience. It's not because, you know, you, you can satisfy a, a physical uh, hunger or thirst. It's, it's, it's very emotional, right? Uh, so if you can get something that can get people hyped up about uh, through crypto, uh, why not use it? Thank you. Hi, Joe. I was wondering if you could talk about a couple of the trends on where you think the next like, innovation is going to be to show off kind of your NFTs. Um, like you mentioned, Twitter profiles, and I think in a lot of games, like you can wear a lot of these. Like if you get an NFT, you can even like maybe start wearing it in like games and things like that. But wondering where you think um, where people can like show off like what they have or like share it with their friends and, and where that's how that's really going to take shape over the next couple of years. Well, uh, I don't know, Rich, do you wanna? I, 
I think there's a couple of things, and you kind of hit on some of them. I think, like, when you say show off, I mean, ostensibly that means people can take an NFT they bought and integrate it maybe into their social profiles on different platforms. So, like, Twitter, for example, is actively, you know, this is public information, working on integrating verify NFTs into profile pictures. You know, and you hear about Facebook rebranding itself as meta because they want to create metaverses that essentially could also probably include verify NFTs into those uh, social platforms. Maybe that's like one category. The other category that I, that I think is really important is, is actually like, you know, Joe mentioned this a little bit, but NFTs um, allow you to own something. And when you can own something digitally, um, it actually changes how certain applications in the digital context work. And one specific one is games. So if you ever play a game where you bought an item, like you bought a skin in Fortnite or you bought a, a weapon in World of Warcraft or something like that, Traditionally, they were always confined to the four walls of the publisher, of the game itself. You couldn't take it with you afterwards. You didn't own it as an asset. You were basically just a renter in that game. Um, and I think one of the more exciting applications of NFTs also in the context of, of games um, in particular is now you can own something that you purchased through a game, but you can kind of own it forever. You can trade it on a secondary platform. You can maybe take it to another game. Um, and I think maybe those are two exciting places that I think you'll start seeing more of in the real sort of like near term. The first one is social platforms having verified NFTs be a part of um, their operation. So whether it's like Twitter or metaverse concepts, having NFTs be, be sort of verifiably used. And the second one is I think just you're going to see more games have NFTs be an integral part of their experience. And so those NFTs are going to be tradable and interactable outside the four walls of the actual game itself. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that, that second phenomenon has uh, huge implications for the whole uh, gaming world uh, because you can take an NFT and play that NFT, use or play that NFT across different games produced by different publishers. So it completely upends the existing gaming model. Uh, you know, today, if you're Activision Blizzard and you're creating games, uh, you want people to play your games uh, and trap everybody within your ecosystem and continue to spend and buy, you know, uh, in-game items within your own game. But imagine if someone buys an in-game item and they leave your game and start playing uh, another game made by Epic. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very, very disruptive thing uh, for the gaming industry. Um, so the previous question is actually uh, a little bit of a segue into my question, which is a little bit of an extension. Um, it kind of pertains to the form of NFTs in the sports space. Um, I'm very curious, something that I'm kind of seeing in the NFT art space is this transition into physicality. Um, so something that's really prevalent now is having statues or things like hologram cartridges, which people can put NFTs in as a way of displaying. And so there's this really big shift towards moving NFTs into physicality. And so we talked a little bit about how NFTs can be used as profile pictures, gaming things. Um, but I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on whether or not you think within the sports industry, are NFTs going to be something that are kind of translated into physicality? Uh, so you, what you mean is uh, actually uh, being able to display an NFT on a screen, let's say, in a physical space, right? Either, either being able to display it or having some sort of physical interaction as a consequence of owning an NFT. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's definitely coming. Uh, I'll give you an example. It's kind of a personal example. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I bought an NFT uh, of a very short clip in a movie uh, called In the Move for Love. It's, um, it's a Chinese um, kind of a love story. Uh, I love that movie. And uh, it's made by a very famous dire director named Wong Kar Wai. So I, I bought the NFT from the director. And uh, it's a two minute clip. Uh, now, if it just sort of, you know, if I don't put it on an open, uh, sort of a platform like OpenSea or anything to display it, uh, if it just sits in my phone, I feel like I'm not getting value out of it, right? The whole point of owning art is that you could share it, you could show it publicly if you, if, 
uh, you know, if you want. So I actually want to uh, put that NFT into the Barclay Center, and we wanted to dedicate, you know, we have a restaurant in Barclay Center, we want to dedicate one of the rooms as uh, the NFT room, or whatever it, it's called, and maybe we can get some sponsorship dollars out of an NFT company. Uh, <laughs> and in that room, we will uh, display uh, the NFT art owned by our fans, right? And we can have a rotating exhibition, uh, something like that. And that's, that's how I'm thinking about it. Uh, and I think definitely, you know, the, uh, the, the physical world and the digital world uh, will at some, uh, at some point combine uh, to get more, more excitement and more value uh, out of the whole thing. Yeah. Hi, Joe. First, thank you for giving this talk. My question is, what skills or lessons do you think you learned from Yale College and especially Yale Law that gave you the tools to succeed in business or crypto or any other industry you're working in? And what advice would you have for undergraduates? Yeah. Uh, for undergrads, right? Uh, are, are you an undergraduate or are you from yep. a grad? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I actually, uh, I just spent some time earlier this afternoon with a, a small group student at the uh, uh, School of Engineering, and uh, they kind of asked me the same question. Uh, what I took away from Yale uh, was the fact that there are just so many people that are talented, that are smart, and most of them are smarter than you are, right? So I, you know, I, I my, my four years as an undergraduate, like intellectually I was challenged, but I was also like heavily intimidated, right? Because there's so many smart people. So I, when I went into the real world in, in the work context, you know, going into Alibaba where I'm one of the founders, so I, I'm in a position of hiring other people. Uh, I always want to hire people that are smarter than you are and uh, smarter than I am because that's how you improve the organization. If you think about it, the founder should be uh, the catalyst for growth rather than the limiting factor of an organization, which means that the founder has to think about bringing more, better people, more talented people into the organization. And I, having spent time at Yale, I know that there's just so many talented people out there that are better than, than I am that could you know, help me do uh, help me, you know, uh, promote the mission of the company and uh, build value in a business. So that's, that's uh, kind of, that's what I learned at Yale. Uh, advice to undergraduates. I've given this advice before. Um, I think in the future, the world is going to be about data, uh, but also about human beings and interaction with human beings. I, you know, despite all, all the things that the Silicon Valley people say about AI and things like that, I still think human interaction and human cognition uh, are important. Uh, so my advice is to uh, take a class in data science and also take a class in psychology, okay? And you'll get the, both, the best of both worlds. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, as we move towards the gamification of NFTs and those moving into the metaverse video game type world, how do you see uh, the value of those NFTs trickling down to the athletes and whether that will be through a player's association or more so from an individual standpoint since that's a representation of their, perf their performance in real life? Yeah, so uh, definitely in, in the realm of professional sports, the players' associations are already benefiting from NFTs. Uh, if you look at NBA Top Shots, uh, the royalty that they pay to the league is actually, they pay two entities. They pay the league of, you know, with all the team owners, and then they pay the players' association as well. Uh, so the players are already you know, benefiting from that. And I think for, uh, with the uh, name, image, and likeness, uh, legislation, uh, it, it's great for college athletes. Um, you know, you can, you can actually make money from NFTs. 
I, I think it's great. I think it, there's, there's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to unlock a lot of value and benefit the, the students. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Hey Joe, uh, speaking of human interaction, the interesting thing about um, playing cards and physical memorabilia is that athletes can autograph them, which raises the value and gives it more meaning. Do you think there's a place for that in NFTs going forward with athlete validation? Yeah, I think there should be a, a partnership between an NFT company and DocuSign. <laughs> Um, for example, if, uh, if an athlete actually creates the NFT, right, and look, I mean, think about the value of having and uh, buying a piece of NFT that's actually being transferred from Tom Brady's wallet to your wallet. That's, you could talk about that at every cocktail party you go to, right? So, um, you know, I, I think there's a, uh, Definitely, the, the athletes, athletes themselves will put their imprint on NFTs, and uh, I see a lot of potential there. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Uh, my question is, during your time as an owner of the Nets, how have you kind of like educated your fans about the advantages of NFTs, and like what specifically have you done to kind of interact with your fan base regarding NFT? Uh, so far, we have not. As a team owner, I'm actually thinking about what is the right framework for promoting NFTs uh, for the entire league, because that'll all trickle down. Uh, and the reason is, as one of the 30 teams, you're, you're just one part of the fan base, right? And if the idea is to use NFTs to capture the broadest fan base, uh, we should do it for the league first, and then maybe some of the benefits would trickle down. Of course, there, there would be specific, like, Brooklyn-based ideas, but it's not going to be as good as if all 30 teams come together. I think in, in the area of crypto and NFTs, uh, you know, the sum of the parts is worth more than the parts themselves. Thank you so much. Hi, Joe. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, Billy from the School of Engineering. Uh, uh, great talk. And uh, there's one relevant technology one of your uh, teammates mentioned is the metaverse that's proposed by Facebook now. Uh, what do you think the potential application of that could be for sports and for the other business areas that you're familiar with? Yeah. Uh, well, any kind of uh, uh, like NBA 2K or uh, NFL Madden is, is a sports game. You're kind of in the sports metaverse, right? And uh, you can make it more immersive using virtual reality technology. The whole idea of metaverse is that it is an alternative to real life. So if you wanted to get away from real life and you can immerse yourself in, in something that is completely virtual and derive uh, pleasure out of it, uh, that's, that's great, derive entertainment value out of it, right? So I, uh, I think uh, when you look at a fan's mindset, uh, they sometimes just want to lose themselves and put themselves in a position where either they're a player or they're a spectator or whatever, uh, in, a, in a kind of a virtual world. You know, long-suffering fans of bad teams uh, can definitely imagine a metaverse where their team's always winning all the time. So, um, you know, I think that I, I could see a lot, of, a lot of applications there. Hi, Joe. Um, my question is, if the blockchain system is so secure, does that mean there would not be any alteration or improvement to it in the next, like, say, 100 years from now? And what is your opinion on blockchain, like, centuries from now in the far future? Well, uh, it, it's, it's two things. Te the technology will always improve, um, but whatever is the asset uh, that sits on the blockchain uh, is supposed to be permanent and immutable. You can't change the fact that you own a Bitcoin, uh, and, uh, th and that, that in itself has an intrinsic value. So that won't change, but I think blockchain technology uh, will continue to evolve and change. I think everybody is looking at blockchain as 
kind of the next generation of computers. And in order to uh, you know, be a real sort of processing kind of computer, you have to be able to uh, improve transaction speeds. So there's tons of people that are working, that are developing uh, you know, additional layers of protocols or side protocols that will improve transaction speed of uh, the, the, you know, the basic uh, layer one blockchain protocols. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Tsai. I'm Franek. I'm a Polish undergrad here. Um, and since you spoke about the US and, Euro and Europe, I wonder how does Asia square into this picture? Uh, I know MB NBA is big in China, but uh, how big is the NFT market in China? And what is your perspective on the future of that uh, participation mm. of Asia in it? Yeah, I, well, I think Asia is a lot of different countries. Uh, specific to China, uh, the, the government has uh, made a policy decision to restrict uh, the mining uh, and also trading of cryptocurrencies. So that definitely affects uh, uh, activities in NFTs. And, uh, but the government is not hostile to the idea or the technology of blockchain. You know, there's the idea of permission chains that you know, uh, authorized entities can you know, set up a series of nodes and create their own blockchain. Uh, to verify transactions, to authenticate uh, things, uh, that is permissible. And uh, uh, I'm not sure how that will apply to the sports area because, you know, to uh, again, fan engagement engagement is all about creating hype, creating that emotional response, and using crypto to uh, generate that kind of uh, emotional excitement. Uh, probably requires uh, you using uh, sort of the public uh, blockchain protocols as opposed to creating your own permission chain. Um, so I don't know how that works in the China context. It, it remains to be seen. Right now, the policy and the laws are very, very restrictive. Uh, so, uh, so that's definitely a, an obstacle. As far as other countries, uh, I, I have no doubt that there will be blockchain and the idea of NFTs will be big in Japan, for example, Japanese baseball or soccer in Korea. Um, in a different context, uh, you know, uh, not in the crypto context, but I was uh, visiting a sports betting company. You know, they basically make a market and uh, allow people to bet on sports. And we were looking at who's doing the betting and what do they bet on? And they bet on really esoteric stuff. like third tier Korean soccer. Uh, it, it's like teams with names that you've never heard of. And the same guy bets on uh, Korean soccer and th the Thai soccer league in Thailand at the same time. He'll, he'll have multiple bets. Um, it, it just tells you that if you have, uh, if you create sort of this emotional excitement, people will do anything. Uh, doesn't have to be like the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball. They can bet on minor sports. And um, that's, it's good for lacrosse. Not that lacrosse is a minor sport, but it, you know what I mean. It's not, it's not one of the big four leagues. Yet. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for your uh, inspiring talk. I'm a big fan of Brooklyn and Net. Yeah. So I wonder, um, so during your talk, you mentioned like, you know, the, uh, game token probably can give the fans a uh, potential rights to vote. But I wonder, would it cause like issue in equity? For example, like for the NBA All-Star game, I can vote on Kevin Durant like once per day, but does it mean like, you know, if I have more money, more tokens, I can like vote multiple times, something like that. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, but then you talk about corporate governance. Does that create issues of equity? You know, if you own more, shares in Apple, you can have more votes in determining executive compensation, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's always, when you have a, a system like that where it's not uh, just one person, one vote, it's really one share, one vote, and you can buy, a same person can buy multiple shares, it always creates that, that, that problem. Uh, I'm not sure how to solve it, you know, <laughs> yes, it, it does create some uh, equity issues. Yeah. 
Thank you. Hi. Um, glad to have you here, Joe. Thanks for a great talk. I'm a law student, and I'm thinking about NFTs from a comparative law perspective. Okay. So it looks like Europe has been fast to adopt fan tokens, but on, on our side of the Atlantic, we haven't. Instead, we've opted for you know, more collectible like NBA Top Shots or whatever the NFL is doing. Right. As, a, as an owner, can you speak to some of the legal issues that you're facing in, in regards to issuing fan tokens? Uh, well, I think the biggest legal issue uh, in, in every jurisdiction is whether these tokens are securities. Uh, and if they are securities, they will be regulated by, you know, here in this country, regulated by the SEC. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then you will have lots of restrictions on the issuance itself, uh, the trading, the disclosure regarding, uh, you know, the, any, any kind of underlying activity or participants. So uh, that, that's, that's probably the fundamental uh, uh, legal issue here. I mean, Rich, do you want to chime in on some of the other legal problems? You know, honestly, I mean, I think, I think the main one is just the difference in uh, openness and flexibility on security. So, I mean, the other difference, obviously, is European uh, legal regimes are a little bit more federated. You obviously have some commonality of standards set by EU-related legal uh, standards, but there, there's obviously country by country specific laws, and obviously we also have the UK versus the rest of Europe. Um, in the states, I guess you could argue there's a little bit of a federated concept because sub-federally you have 50 different states and a couple of jurisdictions. But I still think the, the 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 heart of the matter is a securities law question, right? It's how we test and whatever's going on in Europe and the UK. Great. Thank you. you you know about the Howey test, yeah. right? The yeah. seminal case, and yeah. yeah. Uh, another area, since you're a law student, uh, another area for you to probably look at is if you're interested in corporate law, is to study uh, what is the right legal regime to regulate or not regulate decentralized autonomous organizations, the DAOs. Um, that's a that's a fascinating area. We're spending some time on that, uh, as you probably know. Uh, the issue with these DAOs is that uh, at the end of the day, they're not limited liability. So the participants uh, potentially could become liable for whatever happens in the whole ecosystem. And um, uh, so Wyoming has uh, actually came out with a le new legislation that would protect, that would give limited liability to, to DAOs. Um, that's something that's pretty interesting. And uh, another uh, sort of you know, related to securities law and DAOs is that I always felt that a lot of these DAOs are created, they're just like mutual funds. They just pooled capital uh, to invest in different things, except that they call themselves DAOs in order to avoid being classified as a security. Uh, so that's, that's also another sort of interesting area to, to look into. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Um, Thanks for giving this talk. It was very interesting. <clears throat> um, you mentioned earlier that you thought that the NBA is a very star-driven league. So I wanted to ask, how do you as an owner maintain a good relationship with the stars? Or maybe more broadly, like how do you maintain a good relationship with the very talented and smart people you work with every day? Yeah. Um, well, to the NBA question, uh, it really depends on the on the individual player. Um, uh, I have very good relationships with some of the stars on our team, uh, but not others. Not, not bad relationship, but just more, less of a relationship um, because I don't talk to them very often. But some of the other ones, I'm on a like, daily text basis. I could send them a text and make a joke or whatever. You know, it's, it's like we're friends. Uh, so it's, it's really just depending on the individual. I don't think, I think it has less to do with whether they're stars or not stars. Um, I think in the case of the NBA, the big stars are uh, earning a lot of their income from non-basketball activities. Uh, so they have sponsors, they have a lot of this. So you have to be generally aware of what else is going on in their life. Uh, and be respectful of that. I, I, I think that's very important. And f it, it always uh, is, uh, you know, a helpful 
uh, or advisable to understand what's going on with your families. Uh, everybody has families. Uh, some of them have kids. Uh, always good to get to know that as aspect of their life a little bit. You know, you talk about sort of how does an entrepreneur interact with like other successful people, right? Uh, I think it's just basic human respect. I, I think that's really important. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I view myself as just a normal person. So, uh, so the way you treat them, the way you talk to them, uh, you know, you, you just act normal. You're just like a regular guy. And that's, that's the best thing uh, when you deal with other uh, celebrities or very, very successful people. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Joe. Uh, it seems to me that primarily the value of NF NFT is driven primarily by the brand they're associated with. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense to me how fan tokens can drive engagement for existing fans. But once the hype of MFTs drive down and it's basically just a technology we accept, how can they keep getting new fans involved? Like for me, the question is similar to how, like why would a fan buy a jersey from a team they're not a fan of? Um. I'm trying to un understand the question. They, th you mean, uh, so look, um, I think you always need to find the connection between the, the fan and what are they the fan of? Are they the fan of the player or are they the fan of the team or do they just generally like basketball, right? And so these are different levels of fandom and you find different ways to engage with them. Uh, so when you have your uh, NFT token strategy, uh, you still need to sort of work those issues out. Um, and uh, I think, you know, maybe some, some fans would just want to have James Harden tokens as opposed to Brooklyn Nets tokens, right? And you just have to kind of work those things out and, and, and figure out a strategy. But I think generally speaking, uh, when you get into this sort of fan token area, I, I, I think of it as a currency, as something that has value that could be traded. Uh, and you wanna have the broadest, most liquid market possible. So it would make sense not to issue just a James Harden token, but more broader things uh, like like an NBA token or something like that, right? That makes sense, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Hi Joe, thank you. Uh, honor to be uh, the last one <laughs> ask the question. Um, first year MBA student from the School of Management. Um, I just have a question about what are the similarities you found uh, leading companies like Alibaba and also being an owner of a sports team? Do you find anything uh, similarities in between these two um, arenas? Yeah. Uh, oh, they're very different things. Uh, obviously, one is a technology company. The sports business itself uh, is an entertainment business, all right? Uh, but there are some commonalities, uh, I, I think, in, in, in any context, uh, execution is very important, you know, getting getting to point A to point B, just getting things done and getting it done well. And when it comes to executing well, the most important thing is you put the right people in the right place. Uh, so whether I'm in Alibaba or I'm reviewing uh, the Brooklyn Nets business, I always ask for the organizational chart uh, because I wanna know who is responsible for doing what and who's gonna be held accountable if things go wrong. Uh, that's always uh, in very, very important. Uh, I'm very well known for blowing up people's organizational charts. I just said, this doesn't make any sense and you, got, you gotta go back and you know, redo your, your organization. Oftentimes, when you have bad management or bad execution, it's because you put the wrong person in the wrong job. Uh, you know. And, and that's, uh, that could be improved uh, if you match the, uh, the skill set 
with the responsibility. All right. Okay. Well, I hope you all will join me in All right. Thank you. Thank you.